I'm in a finished basement here in Connecticut and we're going to be installing our system, but there's already a waterproofing system in here. We're going to be tearing that system out. There's some real do's and some real don'ts that you want to follow when you're dealing with a finished basement. We've been working with the homeowner here in Weston, Connecticut, and he did a whole bunch of the prep for his finished basement. He actually removed the drywall. And as he did, what became very clear is that, well, there's a big gap between the wall and where the, this system is that was, in, that was installed by another customer. This area, when it was finished, had drywall that came down and went right down here, and they took this system and put it right up against where the finished wall was. So for water to get into this system, it had to fill up around the finished wall and then work its way all the way around to the pump. Now nothing happens with uh, lack of light, lack of ventilation, and an organic food source until you add one more component, and that's moisture or water. Putting your waterproofing system up against the finished out wall is a horrible idea because you're creating a mold engine. And this was all removed, was completely covered with mold. And as we talked with the homeowner, he said all the wood was completely rotted out where this particular waterproofing system was installed. This wall was also finished. And if you can look at where the system was installed, there's a gap of about two, two and a half inches wide and getting into three to four inches wide as we go down the wall. And then there was a studded out wall here. And we were talking with the owner who actually did the prep work. And he said as he removed the boards, they were all completely dry rotted, just like we were talking about over in the other area. And there's another area in the front where he took a board out and it basically turned to sand. That's how dry rotted it was. This is a perfect example of what you don't want to do when you're trying to waterproof your basement. So this, this stud was cut out. He had to cut it out in a couple of different sections. But this was sitting right on top of where that is. When you have a, a customer that has to go back and repair a system, uh, you know there's some real problems with it. This, is, this stone was put in by the customer in order to add some extra drainage. Once again, we had a reverse pitch, so the water was going the wrong way. So when water was filling up in here, it, would hit, it had to actually go uphill, which water doesn't do. So instead of, of being able to travel through, it came over on top of the floor and flooded the basement again. The components of hot water base barred heat are, you're going to have some copper piping, and that's going to run around the area. And then this one has a copper pipe running through the center of it, and it's basically metal pieces that, that are called elements that absorb the heat and disperse the heat in, into the room. So we have some flexibility, so we can actually move this out a little bit, work our hammers in behind, and also move it that way, work our hammers in front of it. Uh, the only downside is the elements get dinged up a little bit. doesn't affect how they work at all without removing the baseboard heat. In order to remove baseboard heat, you have to cut the pipes, drain the entire heating system of the, of the house, and then have plumbers come back in, reattach it, and then you have to refill up the whole system with water. So it's time consuming and it's also costly. We can avoid all of that time and all of that expense by working around this using the flexibility of the pipes. Where you manage the water and how much drainage you have are key. When we look at the system that we're about to tear out here, it's a very low volume system and it's set up in a way that makes it very difficult for the water to travel through it to get to over where the pump station is. And as it gets here, it has to make a 90 degree turn and then it goes out and stops and then isn't even connected. As you'll see, I already know and we haven't even broken out the concrete. You're gonna see it has to work its way by itself, get all the way over to here, do another right angle, work its way this way and around this wall. And then there's another grate over here that has the same type of setup where it's not a continuous system get through that and work its way over to the pump. And it's gonna be very clear as we tear the system out, just what you don't wanna do when you're waterproofing your basement. If you look here, you're seeing cracking where they re-cemented to put their system in all the way along there. That's because this floor has been taken off the footing and it lost the support of that footing. And in so doing, this floor can move and settle and then it's not going to be supported by the re-cementing of the floor. If you look there, as we take out the pieces of concrete, that floor that they re-cemented back on is about that thick. So it's not giving any support to the existing or the main body of the floor. So this is a structural uh, defect, a flaw in this particular type of system. But especially when you apply it to a traditional three-piece foundation that really requires that you keep that floor on that ledge of the footing 
and it's really nice to have that floor up against and holding the walls out. Okay, as we're installing our super dry system, we're removing the concrete floor, we ran into radiant heat. Apparently this is a really, really old system that hasn't worked in a long, long time. The customer would like us just to cut through it because it actually makes for a much easier installation of our super dry system. But this is how it looks. What you have here are copper tubings that were laid out in loops like this all the way across the whole basement before they put the concrete floor. Pour the concrete right over so that it fills up around the copper pipes. Then the hot water would run through these pipes and it would actually heat the floor now in this case, the homeowner doesn't want it. It hasn't been used, it's been obsolete, hasn't functioned in decades. So we're gonna be taking this out as we go. But if that weren't the case and you wanted to keep this, we'd have to work around it. With the copper pipe, it's a whole lot more work, but it, it is doable. As we started the whole process, it was one event after the other. We started breaking into the floor and we realized that there was actually radiant heat. And as we went down about three inches, that was it. That was how thick that floor was. And then we found there was an entire, another floor underneath that. So we have two floors that we're dealing with. And the original company only came in, chipped away a little bit of the second floor that was on there that wasn't really doing anything. It was pretty much just to facilitate the radiant heat and they dropped their gutter in and put about an inch of concrete back on top and it did nothing to stop the flow of water into the basement. Now, what we're gonna show you is how much work it really takes to waterproof a basement correctly compared to a lot of these cookie cutter systems that are out there that you see that American Dry Basement Systems tears out on a regular basis and then puts a real system in. And the funny thing is we both charge about the same amount of money it's just that we do about 10 to 20 times more work. So we still have to stick to our steadfast cardinal rules of basement waterproofing, and that's to keep the structural integrity of the foundation intact. So we're gonna leave a piece of the floor intact. In this case, we're leaving the one that's underneath the second floor that was poured. In other words, the one I'm standing on. You get down three inches, and then we hit a whole second floor that was under there. That's the one that's really uh, involved in the structural integrity of the foundation, where the wall is being supported, uh, and this, needs to be kept intact with the main body of the floor. So we leave what's called an engineering space or an engineering tab right here. And as we go and we make our trench, we're gonna continue and actually do another engineering tab periodically around the foundation to keep the structural integrity intact. And then we're gonna pour back the full thickness of not only the underneath floor, the second floor, but the one on top also and finish it all the way over so that everything supports each other. So that that the floor and the walls and the footing are all united and working together. We talk about where you manage the water, how much drainage you actually have, and how effective that drainage is in dropping the false water table. The other system we had was a gutter that actually sat right here, right here against the wall, and then had this cemented over with about an inch of concrete on top of it, maybe an inch and a half or so. And then we're gonna compare it now to what drainage is really needed in order to address the type of water problem that this property has. Okay, so I'm gonna dig down and show you where our drainage is, and then you're gonna understand where we put our drainage, it, the water can't get anywhere near the bottom of the floor, let alone have the entire floor sit in water. Concrete's porous, it absorbs out water, so you constantly have a damp floor. We eliminate from that ever being a possibility tenfold when you see where our drainage is. But here's the top of the floor. Here's where our drainage is. That's a four inch pipe. So we go down there and we even have some stone, significant amount of stone down in the trench below where that pipe is. So we have an enormous amount of drainage here. Water can't get anywhere near the bottom of the floor. And with this particular foundation, we ended up with a trench that was this wide and this deep. 
And we put in, from what I understand, 275 gallon buckets of stone. Whereas the original drainage system, this gutter system that was put in, uh, had little to no stone. I would imagine the entire system around all four walls had less than one bucket of stone. So when you see the difference between the two approaches, it is, it is a stark difference. And you can see why our super dry system is gonna get this basement completely dry when this gutter system just never had a chance to do what it was proposed to do, and that's give these people a dry basement. One of the nice attributes of the super dry system is because of the amount of volume of drainage that we put in, we have a significant area in order to work with. So even though we've put the pump over there and there's another pump way back over there, if you saw there was our white discharge pipe is through here and then it's coming up and going out the wall, even though our pump is all the way over there, we're able to run the discharge line in our trench, our drainage trench, underneath the floor so it's really nice and clean. It's a, it's a nice finished product when we're done. We have the whole floor sealed up. You can't see any discharge line. It's not running across the ceiling. It's not hooked up to the joists where that would vibrate anytime the pump would go on and shake the house upstairs and be noisy and things like that. So this is a super quiet installation and we're able to accommodate the property and the homeowner to be able to discharge anywhere on any of the four walls, uh, even though the pump is in an entirely different area. Now the pump is on the other side of the basement and we're able to run that discharge through the trench, come up and go out the wall here. This property is kind of challenged because we have a stream in the back, we have a pond over here. It gets really, really wet with any kind of, of rain, not to mention right now we have a lot of, of melting snow and things like that. So the homeowner is trying to keep this area as little extra water as possible. So we have to do something really, shall we say, difficult and work its way into the front yard. It's a little higher elevation, so we have to dig further down into the ground, create our discharge, go from inch and a half to four inch out to our bubbler pot, and we're gonna create a nice, good size stone field in which to discharge this water to. But the real nice attribute is we're able to have the pump over there, run our discharge line through the trench, and actually come up on a wall that's totally opposite of, of where the pumping station is. This is a block foundation. Now cinder blocks are laid end to end. The center part of a cinder block is hollow. There's hollow cores inside of the block. And then when you get to the end, each block has ears on them, on the inside and on the outside. And when you put two blocks together, the ears match up and they actually make another core. And these cores will line up up and down the wall, creating like a hollow cylinder inside of the wall. So when water absorbs from your backfill area into the wall, it only has to go about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half till it hits that hollow core and fills up inside of the block. And that's a problem. The way we address it is we tap what we call weep holes into the block, into those hollow cores, and we'll even do it where the mortar joints are because that's where another core is also and allow it to drain. Then we put our drain board up, leave the weep holes open. Any water that ever could absorb in, it'll go through the weep holes and down into our drainage system. And let me show you here where we've put some of our weep holes. If you look, we've drained and we've tapped into each one of the cores of the block and allow that block to drain. Now, we just tore a system out of here that was installed by another company. No weep holes were done. The walls had water in them, were filling up. And what happens is, is that you have standing water inside of your wall that will actually deteriorate a wall much quicker than if the water were actually allowed to pass through it. If you allow the water to pass through and dry out, the blocks will actually deteriorate much slower than if you didn't do the weep holes and you allowed water to sit inside of your concrete block, which becomes a structural issue later on.
we're finishing up here in Weston, Connecticut. And I'll tell you what, this foundation was really uh, busy, shall we say, a whole lot of stuff going on. And this system that we tore out didn't come even close to providing what this particular foundation needed to get it dry and also to keep it strong. But on a positive note, the system that's in there now is exactly what this particular type of foundation needs. The basement's gonna be completely dry now and moving forward with our proprietary products. We're gonna use our Supercrete product to re-cement the floor. And like I said, it's gonna grow in and reconstruct the floor back into one piece of concrete again, making this foundation once again, structurally sound and completely dry. If you like the video, hit the like button and subscribe. And until next time, enjoy your dry basement.